When people bash Michael Bay's Transformers movies, they all seem to say the same thing. Well, the first one was good at least. And every couple of years, I re-watch these movies because I guess I just really enjoy dumb, mindless action with really bad, sometimes offensive jokes, robots you can't tell apart from each other, and storylines that make less sense than the entirety of Christopher Nolan's filmography. There are people in the future who need us. Who need a tenant. We need to save them here and now. And ever since I've been intelligent enough to comprehend what a good film is, I have shared that same opinion. The first one was good. Well, that time has come again. I was watching clips from the Transformers films and realized I may as well just watch the Transformers films, which is exactly what I did. But I stopped after Dark of the Moon. I did not watch Age of Extinction and The Last Night for reasons I will get to in like 10 seconds. I have come to the conclusion that these first three Transformers films, Transformers, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, Transformers Dark of the Moon, while not perfect, form a rather nice and pretty solid trilogy. So I am making a three-part series on these movies, one video on each installment of Michael Bay's Transformers trilogy, and I am skipping Age of Extinction and The Last Night because one, I don't really like those movies, The Last Night in particular. I know your world was destroyed. I'm sorry. But please don't let ours die too. Two, I want to use this channel to talk about stuff I enjoy. And three, Michael Bay did not originally intend on making Age of Extinction and The Last Night. He was going to do the trilogy and stop there, but there were a lot of zeros on that check. So he stuck around and did more. I will hopefully release one installment of this a month. I make no promises, but my goal is to have the Revenge of the Fallen video up one month after this goes up and Dark of the Moon one month after that goes up. But we'll see. We've seen my upload schedule. It's not really a thing that exists, but I'm going to try. And before I talk about the trilogy as a whole, before I can talk about Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon, I have to go all the way back to 2007, 16 years ago. And I have to talk about the pinnacle of many people's childhoods. This is why Michael Bay's original Transformers film is still great 16 years later. But we were already too late. Before time began, there was the cube. We know not where it comes from, only that it holds the power to create worlds and fill them with life. I'm a simple man. If a movie kicks off with Peter Cullen explaining a bunch of lore I don't understand, I'm hooked. I love the simplicity of this. Giant thing, important to the Transformers, flying towards Earth, that's why all the Transformers are going to Earth, Autobots are the good guys, Decepticons are the bad guys. Simple, easy, awesome. I do find it really funny though that every movie after this retcons the Transformers to have been involved with Earth for ever, yet the AllSpark lands there seemingly by complete coincidence. So let's talk about the hook. Within the first few minutes of your movie, you have to hook your audience. You have to give them a reason to be interested in this movie. If you're going to show them a two and a half hour movie and they're bored by the first few minutes, they're not going to be excited to finish the rest of your two and a half hour movie. So the next scene of this movie is responsible for doing that. The all spark flying to earth is not a hook. That sets up your world. That sets up everything you have going on here. That sets up what the story of this is going to be. But it's not really part of the main movie. So, then we get the hook. And that is the scene at the airbase. I love this scene because it could have been a film all by itself. It's perfectly structured and executed and set up and everything. In fact, the marketing of this movie could have just been this scene and all the butts would have been in all the seats. So let's look at the way they reveal information in this scene. 
we see a chopper flying through the desert. Now, in a movie called Transformers, we're inclined to think this could be a robot, but no, it's not. This chopper is just a normal Earth vehicle transporting a bunch of soldiers through some sort of desert. And in this chopper, we're introduced to our core group of military people for this chunk of the movie and sort of for the whole movie. And it's full of bayisms and stereotypes, but you can get a good sense of how well these people get along. This is not their first mission together. They are friends. They may have been doing this for a couple years now, just the two of them or the, the group of them together. Now the, and the two notable people we meet in this sequence are Lennox and Epps, and we learn a bit about Lennox. Nah, I just can't wait to hold my baby girl for the first time. Lennox has a daughter at home that he has not gotten to see in person, he has not gotten to hold her at all, and it's his drive to get home. This is drama. It's not the most insane, in-depth, internal conflict drama that you would probably look for, but it's reason enough to care about this character and the journey we're about to send him on. Then they touch down at the base and we see the camaraderie between all of them. This is not home, but it's the closest they can get. We then see a chopper flying through the desert. This could be one of theirs, it looks like one of theirs. We don't know, but we learn very quickly it is not one of their choppers because the tail wing 4500 X-ray that it has was a chopper that was shot down months ago. So at this point, as the audience, you're inclined to believe this is a transformer, but we don't know what side he's on. We can assume he's going to be a bad guy. That seems like what he would be, but we can't be certain. The chopper does not respond to any communications. It lands, it transforms, and we're introduced to Blackout. And if it wasn't clear already, this is one of our Decepticons. He is huge, dangerous, he's highly destructive. Everything these soldiers throw at him just bounces off him like it's not even there. And to make matters worse, he's after something, but we don't know what that something is yet. So he has a mission. And because Lennox and Epps are at this base, you're inclined to care about these human characters that are under attack, but the scene ends before we know what happened to them and what their fate is. I know people love to complain about the storytelling of these movies, but this is a perfect scene. The first five minutes of Transformers are flawless. And of course, we met one of our leads in the previous scene, so it's only natural that we meet our other one in the next scene. Our actual main lead of the film, if you will. I will always find it hilarious that Michael Bay cut from a massacre to a stuttering high school student trying to sell a pair of glasses. Michael Bay, you mad lad. Michaela, played by Megan Fox, is also, she's not really introduced in this scene, but she's teased in this scene, but because she doesn't come in until a few scenes later, I'm actually gonna wait to talk about her for a little bit, because before we talk about Michaela, we have to talk about Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac's one scene in this movie is so iconic that anyone who watches it can quote the scene alongside him. He also holds the medal of funniest joke in the franchise. Hey, my man. Oh, don't be like that. If I had a rock, I'd bust your head, bitch. Same as she deaf, you know? And let's talk about our lead for a second. Let's talk about Sam Witwicky. So sit down and strap yourselves in for this hot take. I don't think he's a bad character. This is something that I guess I kind of accidentally jumped on the hate train for for years. But I really like this guy and I picked it up in, re in the rewatch just how cool he is. I know he gets a lot of hate for always yelling no, 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 and screaming and whatnot, but try to put yourselves in his shoes and tell me that you would not be freaking the hell out all the time. And the people who say he doesn't do anything in this movie or he doesn't have an arc, 
I don't know what cut of Transformers y'all watched, because we clearly saw two different movies. Sam Witwicky at the start of this movie is a blithering idiot. He's stuttering all the time, he's kind of just fumbling his way through life, he's really too desperate to get a girlfriend, he's a moody teen, he is scared of literally everything, and then he ends the movie by telling the harbinger of death to go fuck himself. That's badass. I'm never giving you this all spark. Oh, so unwise. So yeah, I don't think Sam's a bad character. He works great for the movies he's in. Like, if, if Sam was a different character in this trilogy, the trilogy would not work. The movies need Sam. He's arguably the heart of the movies. And even if you don't like him, at least he's a character. Unlike some other people in this franchise who are just there. What have you invented? A lot of things. Like? Like a lot of things. Like things that you've heard of. So Sam goes to buy a car, and if you guys have not yet picked up on how well the structure of this movie is at the start and how they reveal stuff to the audience, let me break it down for you. A mysterious character who we know nothing about reveals the main MacGuffin of the movie and the reason all the Transformers are going to be fighting. We're then introduced to one of our lead characters and a Decepticon. Then we're introduced to one of our lead characters and who we can assume is an Autobot. And it's clear through this yellow and black Camaro that we're going to learn more about later that he's here for a reason just like Blackout is. So, hmm... And this is all revealed in just the opening few minutes of the movie. This movie gets going so quick, it never slows down. It is like a master class in pacing. At no point during the 2 hour and 24 minute runtime of this movie did I check to see how much time was left. The next chunk of this film is what Little John would consider bad because there's not enough cool shit happening. Well, Intelligent John now realizes that that's because the movie is building up to it so that it earns the cool shit, something all three of these films do really well. The actual introduction to Michaela is really nicely done. So she breaks up with Trent because he's a dick, and then she starts walking home, and Sam ditches his friend to go give her a ride home. And it's funny, we never see his friend again, he's never mentioned again, but hey, if my car can transform and I'm hanging out with Megan Fox, I probably wouldn't talk to my friends either. So then we have the loser kid stuck in a car with the cool pretty girl and he's trying to impress her. It's so simple and it works so well. The heart of the story is about these three characters, and it's really crazy to think that this is when they all properly meet each other, even though one of them is in car form the entire time. But Sam, Michaela, and Bumblebee are really the main heart and soul of these movies. Well, at least until the third one when they switched her out with Carly because of reasons I'll get to in that video. Also on the subject of Michaela, her full name is Michaela Baines which is very similar to Michael Bay. And I don't know if that was intentional, but it sounds like Michael Bay made himself or the writers or whoever was involved in naming these characters uh, decided to make Michael Bay the most interesting character because Michaela should have been the main character of this trilogy. She has a lot of depth as a character, she's got a lot of history that the movies sort of allude to, and she's badass. I think she's awesome, but hey, I'm fine with her being a co-lead just as much as I would be if she was the main lead. And oh my god, these two characters were my childhood. This movie is a love story in two ways, and I don't think people ever paid attention to the fact that this movie is a love story. So. On one hand, it's about a boy and a girl and them falling in love across this crazy journey they go on. And on the other hand, it's a very unconventional way, but it's about a human and an alien learning to care for each other. That alien just so happens to be a really badass car that can turn his hand into a gun. 
And one of my favorite traits of that car is how great of a wingman he is. So this might be a good time for me to address one of the biggest complaints that these movies get. That they are more about the humans than the Transformers. I understand the complaint and I do think they go way overboard with it later on, especially in 4 and 5, but I think it's balanced pretty well in this and I am about to explain to you why this works. Let's talk about a little film you may have heard of kind of small, no one really talks about it, it's a bit unknown. It's called Jurassic Park. Now Jurassic Park has Jurassic in the title, but there are only 15 minutes of dinosaurs in the movie. The movie instead focuses on its human characters and the relationships between them and it uses the dinosaurs to fuel that. Now I'm not comparing Transformers to Jurassic Park because Jurassic Park is legitimately one of the greatest films of all time and Transformers isn't, but I think it's a good thing to think about when I talk about Transformers. Transformers is not about Optimus Prime or Bumblebee or Megatron or any of the Cybertronians, it's about Sam Witwicky. He is the center of the movie, the story flows through him, everything goes through him, and the Transformers are there to complement that story while still being amazing and having their own story and being badass in their own right. And I think the movie desperately needs to have that human thing to ground it for the audience. It's why I never got behind the Cybertron only movie that people have been talking about for years because while that structure works in a third person shooter like the War for Cybertron and Fall of Cybertron games where you need to have that constant gameplay and that constant action and that constant building and building so that the player doesn't get bored, a movie just does not work in that same vein. And I don't think a Transformers movie would work if you take the human element out. Now, making the human 98% of the movie and making them the only reason the plot can happen, like in Transformers The Last Night, that's when you've gone overboard with it. But I think you need to have a human as your lead character or the movie just does not come together like so many people think it would. Remember when I said this movie makes you earn the cool shit? So you have Sam, Michaela, and Bumblebee kind of doing their thing, although they don't realize what Bumblebee is, but things are starting to look a little strange over in that realm. We know that Sam ends up seeing Bumblebee in robot form. And then in the Middle East, you have the soldiers doing their thing. And both of these stories revolve around those characters figuring out that there's something weird going on with these robots, but they can't fully comprehend what that is. So the soldiers figure out this Scorpionok is just a freak of nature, and then back with the Sam plot line, uh, Bumblebee reveals himself, he whoops Barricade's ass, Sam somehow does not break his foot punting Frenzy like a field goal. That's a tough one out of head, aren't you? And only when the movie gets the status quo of the yellow one is the good guy and everything else is the bad guy, does the movie earn the right to give you the rest of the Autobots. The Autobots arrival to Earth is one of my favorite scenes in the franchise for multiple reasons. First off, the score by Steve Jablonski, the only consistently amazing thing in this franchise, is beautiful in this scene. The track that is appropriately named Arrival to Earth gives such a feel of mysticism to the Autobots as they touch down. And we only get to see glimpses of them. This is one of my favorite things about it, is they don't blow their load and show you the Autobots earlier than they need to. We see Optimus land and we see him start to transform. We see a bit of jazz from a distance. We hear Ratchet touchdown and we see Ironhide's protoform really close up. So you really, it's like not clear. You can't 
fully make out what they look like and what all is happening. And I love the little touch that Sam is the one who cowers behind Michaela. Not only is it a cool twist on stereotypes, it's also 100% in character for Sam to do. I am very tempted to show you the entirety of the next bit, but I don't want to have to deal with copyright issues, so I'm only going to show you a part of it. But whenever you think of peak cinema, this is probably the scene you think of. guys remember when every part of the vehicle was on the robot and vice versa and you could actually track individual pieces across the body while they were transforming as opposed to parts randomly disappearing and reappearing and the vehicle turning into incomprehensible bullshit? Those were the days. I love Optimus Prime so much. Everything he says and does is badass. He's selfless, he's noble, he's honorable, he's loyal and he is legitimately a perfect character. Now, whether or not he's written the same throughout all the movies is something I'll discuss in the future videos, especially in Dark of the Moon. Now, this is an Autobot lineup right here. We got Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, Ironhide, Ratchet, and Jazz. It's just an all-star team. And yeah, I know they nerf Jazz and they off him in this movie, but still, just an all-star lineup of Autobots. But to go against the Autobots is an equally amazing lineup of Decepticons. So we have Starscream, Blackout, Bone Crusher, Barricade, Brawl, a lot of bees. Uh, Frenzy and Scorponok are in there to provide the humans a bit of conflict because they obviously can't go against the big Decepticons. And then Megatron joins in later in the movie. What's crazy, though, is how little screen time the Decepticons have in this film, but how much it doesn't detract from the movie. Barricade shows up to give Sam and Michaela a hard time, and then for most of the movie, it's just frenzy roaming around while the humans do their thing, and then at the end, everyone rolls out to go whoop ass. But at no point did I miss the Decepticons. At no point did I need action sequences. This movie is the movie designed to introduce the world to the Transformers. Not just the audience, but the characters. This is about the world having to adapt to the Transformers and setting up that whole world and all of that mumbo jumbo. It's less focused on big gun and robot go boom. And that works so well. I'm gonna make the argument that Sam watching Sector 7 take down Bumblebee and be helpless to do anything about it is more emotionally impactful than any of the fights Optimus and Megatron have in these films. The story does not need the Decepticons to be compelling. The idea of humans having to adapt to the Transformers is inherently compelling. Sue me. I don't need Autobots and Decepticons fighting in every second of these movies to be entertained. And on the subject of Decepticons, they are at their most terrifying in this film, uh, more so than in any of the other movies, for an idea that only this movie and Bumblebee have actually done. There are only a handful of Decepticons in this movie. There are six Decepticons, not counting Frenzy and Scorponok, to five Autobots. They all look distinct. They all mostly have personalities, and they are all incredibly difficult to defeat. There is no nonsense in this movie where Optimus can take out like 30 Decepticons in the span of less than a minute. Nothing like that happens. Optimus cannot defeat Megatron without help. Ironhide and Ratchet cannot defeat Starscream. Bumblebee gets his feet blown off because of Starscream. And Frenzy, who is like a foot tall, gives the humans a hard time. The fact that there's no faceless Decepticons who are just there to be cannon fodder and that all of them are imposing is so frightening. Especially when you get to the final fight. But where was I in the story? Oh right, coming up on Hoover Dam. But before we get to Hoover Dam, Optimus Prime has to give his amazing speech. But I've seen goodness in them. Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Michael Bay's version of Optimus Prime has been
been criticized for being a psychotic, bloodthirsty, homicidal lunatic. And yeah, I can argue with that all I want, because I think it's not entirely true. But regardless, Optimus Prime is written perfectly in this scene. It's the scene when the Autobots find the location of the Allspark and Optimus says to them that he is willing to sacrifice himself and give his own life so that the Decepticons cannot get the Allspark and destroy the planet. And beyond just showing how selfless he is, it's also just a great study into Optimus Prime as a character. He's wise and he's honorable, and he sees his imperfections. He has a heartbreaking line in this scene when Ironhide asks him why they would even bother saving the humans. Why are we fighting to save the humans? They're a primitive and violent race. Were we so different? It's also the only time in these movies that Optimus says roll out. It's been an honor serving with you all. Autobots. Roll out. And then they go to Hoover Dam, and Hoover Dam isn't just a place they go to. It is a very important chunk of the plot, because Hoover Dam has basically been the cover for everything Sector 7 has been doing for decades. It is an awesome plot twist, and the fact that Sector 7 has always known about the Transformers, and they've just been hiding it to keep the world safe, is dope. And that's such a good idea. And on the topic of story structure and storytelling, Hoover Dam is genius. Every single one of your main characters, Sam, Michaela, Lennox, Epps, Rachel Taylor, and Anthony Anderson, who I haven't talked about, but I think they're fun in this movie also, they go to Hoover Dam and they meet up with John Voight and the Sector 7 guys. Frenzy then falls off the side of the dam, so we now have a Decepticon inside the dam doing nefarious things. The characters then get to go see NBE-1, aka Megatron, and it's a scene when Sam really gets some time to shine because he's just talking shit to the government. We need to know everything you know. We need to know it now. Okay. First, I'll take my car, my parents. Maybe you should write that down. He's no longer cowering and taking a back seat in his own story. Also, remember that they're all discussing what Megatron's name is because that comes back into play later. It's a great bit of plant and payoff. Call him NBE-1. Well, sir, I don't mean to correct you on everything you think you know, but I mean, that's Megatron. NBE-1. That's what we call it. Mr. NBE-1 here, AKA Megatron. But we can't stop there. So we then learn that the Allspark is in the dam. They have been studying it for years, and the dam was actually built around the Allspark. And it's the most realistic and coolest way to handle that particular plot element. And then Frenzy finds the Allspark, gets his body back, and devises a plan as to how he's going to get Megatron and the Allspark both out of there. So the setup for this final battle is genius. All of the human characters are trapped inside the dam with Megatron and the Allspark. The Decepticons are en route and the Autobots are on their way, but they're a pretty far ways away. And the humans can get weapons and they can go get Bumblebee back because Bumblebee's in the dam, but it won't matter because when Megatron breaks out, not if, when, they don't want to be stuck inside the dam with Megatron. I've always gotten on the edge of my seat when I watch this sequence because you just know something is gonna go wrong. But then every time you watch the movie, you always think like, come on, please don't go wrong, but it's gonna go wrong anyway. While Arrival to Earth is my favorite scene, if I had to pick something to compete with that, it would be when they free Bumblebee and get the Allspark. Because the music paired with the awe of seeing it shrink down into something really small is never lost, and I always have to rewind that scene and watch it again. The Allspark creating the Transformers is much cooler than Quintessa doing it just is. From that moment forward, the movie just goes balls to the wall, and it is perfect.
it just keeps escalating into an increasingly worse situation. For example, Frenzy busts Megatron out of cryo, and this is how you introduce a villain. I am convinced that Megatron was able to hear all of those years because we get a callback to when they were all debating his name. I love Frank Welker, he's a god, he truly is, but Hugo Weaving is like the best Megatron voice. He pulls it off so well, and he has admitted that he did this just for the paycheck and he doesn't want to do it again, but oh my god did he bring it in these movies. And it's so cool that Megatron is not introduced until the third act, but you feel like he's been the villain the entire time. That's how instantly terrifying they make this guy when he wakes up and with all the teases he's had through the film. And then they try to do that again in Age of Extinction and they completely miss the reason why it worked in this movie. And Optimus and the Autobots pulling a 180 to rejoin with Bumblebee and the humans is so cool. This movie really does put me in my happy place. I'm just always so happy watching it. It just exudes so much badass. It's easily one of my favorite movies to watch. Also on the subject of badass, this. <laughs> The structure of the final battle is so perfect. They get to Mission City and there's a subversion immediately when you realize Starscream is the jet flying overhead and he bombs the place and Bumblebee sacrifices himself to uh, protect everyone. Uh, and then he loses like half his legs and is basically taken out of the fight. So we're two Autobots down right off the bat because Bumblebee's injured and Prime is missing. I'm not gonna leave you. It then comes down to Ratchet, Ironhide, and Jazz to fight Brawl, or Devastators they call him in this movie. I guess there's two Devastators, but like Brawl is his actual name. Uh, and he beats Jazz's ass, but they end up taking him down. So the main Decepticon problem is handled, and right when you think it's mellowing out, enter Megatron. The humans fall back at the sight of Megatron, Jazz gets killed, and look, I've said the movie's not perfect. I need to address this criticism right here. Jazz's death, I think, is the worst thing in the movie. Not that he dies. I like the idea that an Autobot dies in the first movie, because a lot of movies refrain from killing a main member of the group in the first installment. It's just that it comes out of nowhere. He didn't even get a throwdown with Megatron. He didn't even die to do something cool. He just gets shot and then ripped in half instantly. But I digress. We're three Autobots down, and now the rest of the Decepticons, except Barricade, who just leaves the movie after the highway scene, uh, they all get here. So now the situation's getting even worse. And remember, we only have two Autobots left. And the entire fight takes place on like three city blocks, so it's about just holding as much of it as possible, which I think works really well as opposed to the giant full-scale wars of the other movies. Now, yes, we're going to talk about my baby, Dark of the Moon, in a couple videos, but the thought of a rather kind of small fight I think really helps this movie. And as I said, Decepticons have won. We're kind of out of Autobots here. And then enter Optimus Prime. Optimus always shows up fashionably late to the fight. I love it. It's such a staple of these movies. I kind of hope it happens in Rise of the Beasts, quite honestly. And they overcook it in 4 and 5 with how he comes in. It's just so simple in this movie. He comes in, epic music is playing, he transforms, he whips up his battle mask, and he yells at Megatron that they're gonna go have a fight now. No insane stuff like dinosaurs and dragons. Just Optimus looking cool and being cool. Another great thing about this fight is there's a clear A and B. Sam has to get the AllSpark from here 
to here and there's a war in the middle of the city so it's gonna be pretty difficult I always wondered though why one of the Autobots didn't just transform and drive him uh, but you know we the movie has to happen I haven't talked about frenzy fighting John Voight and the two analysts at Hoover Dam because it's it's not that cool uh, it, it's clearly only there so that all the side characters can have something to do and even though I like that they have a hard time dealing with Frenzy, I just don't think it's that engaging of a fight when you have Optimus and Megatron fighting, uh, you know, just a little ways over. I will say, though, when I was little, Frenzy decapitating himself was the funniest shit. I see. Then Michaela shows off why she's so cool, and she gives Bumblebee the assist he needs to kill Brawl. Talk about durability. The amount of firepower they send Brawl's way that he just walks off is insane. And remember, he went down once. They had already defeated him, and he got back up. He's just built different. And that cute little peek through the mask that Bumblebee does after he kills Brawl cracks me up. Bumblebee is so adorable in these movies. The fact that Lennox gets to take down Blackout because Blackout wrecked the base and they had fought previously I think is a nice payoff. This movie pays off and wraps up really well. Also I just realized there's a piece of the tree that fell off the tree and I'm looking at it and I'm wondering how long it's gonna be before it falls. But the real meat and potatoes of the third act is the fight between Optimus Prime and Megatron and Optimus is just getting demolished. For a guy who has been in stasis for thousands of years, Megatron is a real powerhouse. Makes you wonder what he was like in his prime on Cybertron, because as the rest of these movies show us, Megatron ain't really in his prime anymore. And I love the fact that defeating Megatron is an effort between all of the characters. So the analysts and John Voight had to call the Air Force who could send it in under Lennox's command because Lennox was on the ground and then Optimus was fighting Megatron and Sam's the one who got to deliver the killing blow. It ties everyone and everything in the movie together and it shows just how powerful Megatron is. I do find it hilarious that Optimus knew the AllSpark could kill someone so instead of saying hey why don't we just you know put it in Megatron's chest he said, I'll just sacrifice myself. The poetry of Megatron dying to the AllSpark, though, because he's the one who wanted it, and Sam gives him exactly what he wants. This whole film wraps up so nicely. Optimus, realizing they can't go back to Cybertron, uh, learns they have a bunch of new allies on Earth. Bumblebee can speak now. Yes, I know they retcon it in the next movie, but... I don't care, he speaks, he and Sam decide they're gonna stick together. I wish to stay with the boy, if that is his choice. Yes. Megatron gets dumped in the ocean instead of just blown up for some reason. Ironhide gives Lennox a lift and Lennox gets to hold his baby girl and then Sam gets the girl and makes out with her on top of Bumblebee while all the Autobots watch, which I'm not gonna lie, it's really weird. Everyone loves a good Optimus Prime speech, and this may be his best one. He narrates over the entire ending, just like he narrated over the opening of the film, and he ends the movie by looking to the stars and sending a message to his surviving friends. We are here. We are waiting. No! Transformers 2007 is not a perfect movie. It has flaws, but it knows what it wants to be and it executes it to perfection. And I do think that it is a great start to the trilogy. Next month, I will be back to discuss Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, and then one month after that, I will be discussing Transformers Dark of the Moon. Again, I will not be talking about Age of Extinction and The Last Night because I don't really like those movies, and they aren't really, they don't really feel like part of Michael Bay's story. He originally didn't intend for them to be part of his story. They just ended up happening later because money is the greatest negotiator. So if you guys want to get notified, know when those videos drop, 
subscribe and click on the bell so that you will know and prepare for some hot takes. You might want some popcorn for those. Also, leave a like on this video. Leave your thoughts down in the comments below of what you think of Transformers and what you think of this video. If I open your eyes to anything you hadn't thought of or if I missed something that you picked up on, I would love to hear it and I will see you all next time.